uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, our streaming will start in 30 seconds. And welcome to Technica and thanks a lot for joining this webinar. This is actually a multiplier event, the TeamWe project multiplier event. TeamWe is a QA2 project and today we have a two hours and a quarter event to present the results of the project. Uh, we have this agenda that uh, my colleague Enara from Mecca will introduce later. So yeah, uh, from my side, that's everything. I just want to hope that you have a great event, and you, that you enjoy the day. And yeah, I'll just give the floor to uh, Enara Iriondo from Mecca. Enara. Thank you, Diego. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. So let's start with the agenda for today. In afterwards, we're going to listen about the project and the patina. Then we'll have uh, Gorka Gastelumendi talking about humanized digitalization. Then Tim Wee will explain about different methodologies. And after a short break, students will come here and talk about their solutions to the cases they have developed during this week. So, first of all, I want to welcome Anne Patana. She's the coordinator. She is the coordinator of this team we project. She is the project manager from Tredu in Tampere, Finland. And if I had to explain team we in two ideas, I would say it is welfare technology and it is team teaching and of course team learning. But Anne, the floor is yours and she will talk us about the project. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Good morning and uh, welcome from on my behalf as well. How can I make it? Uh -huh. So what is Team We about? Team We is an Erasmus Key Action 2 project, a development project, uh, so to say. And the intention was to do all the activities, oh, it's enough, yes. okay, between years 2019 and 2021, but because of the COVID situation, we have extended the project with one year, so it is a three-year project, uh, as it is now. And I'm the project manager for the, the project, and I come from Tredo Tampere Vocational College, in Tampere in Finland. The other vocational colleges involved are Delchen College from the Netherlands, Svolle in Netherlands, and Mecca from Elgoy Bar in the Basque Country. So we are the three vocational colleges, and we have the role, or uh, we, our role is to control and uh, uh, process a student process so that everything goes well with the student work. And uh, Tampere University of Applied Sciences is in charge of the teacher process, teachers, pedagogical uh, method, methodology and learning of new methods. And we have Technica, whose responsibility is the evaluation of the single activities and the evaluation of the whole project and all the processes involved. So what is TeamWe about? It's simply written in the project application. We want to involve teachers and students from different fields of education. And by that we mean social healthcare, electrical or mechanical engineering and media in solving real problems relating to welfare technology together in teams 
in workplaces in the field of social health care. And the problems are either related to existing welfare technologies or technologies that are not used at the workplaces yet, but could be used if we help them a little with the, our ideas. And the COVID situation being mentioned again, uh, earlier, I, I go back to that, that we couldn't unfortunately arrange the meetings at the workplaces with vulnerable elderly people. So we have developed cases simulating real, uh, real cases with real clients in elderly homes, in nursing homes or in their own homes. And how do we do it? How are we doing it? We are still at the middle states of the project. We have different tools. We have design thinking for problem solving, um, just one as one example. And then the teaching methods we use to carry the process through. And we have case-based learning, phenomen-based learning, flipped learning, um, and I think that's all I've mentioned, yeah, on the slide. And this project is complementary to a project we did earlier between 2017 and 19, uh, because welfare technology is relatively new and people need to learn about it, to use it, and, and also the teachers need, need to learn about it and the workers in the field. So we wanted to develop material how we could teach welfare technology. And that was only in the field of social and health care. And then we extended it to other fields as well. And I'll show you just a quick look, if I can. Um, I can't. It should, be, it should be here, but I can't find it now. What is it? It's, 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 if I... Click this open. How can I back, back to my presentation? That's my problem. <laughs> right, here you see the front page, or then you don't see it. Mm. I couldn't get to the page, and now. Yeah, okay, I couldn't see those. Oh, from here. Now, all right, so there you see the front page. So um, we have prepared teaching material. So anybody teaching social in the field of social and health care in need of material for teaching welfare technology, there's a material bank for your perusal. There where you see teaching materials, they are categorized according to the themes. So please feel free to, to use the material. background for the project, as I shortly or briefly mentioned earlier, is the growing older population, increasing health care costs, lack of care workers, we all know about these facts, have implications on current health care practice, practices around the world. And according, accordingly, our current health care system or welfare systems are unmaintainable, and it's necessary to adapt learn and develop health and elder care that meet the needs of patients and providers. And they, we have come to the conclusion that to meet these needs, welfare technologies are critical for elder care organizations. And that's why we also started with the project when we started in 2017. And what exactly do we mean with welfare technology? Because it can, if you just look at the word, it, you can think of different things. And the definition, 
You can read here. It is defined as the knowledge and use of technology to maintain or increase the feeling of safety, activity, participation and independence, independence for a person who has or is at increased risk of developing a disability. Safety, activity, participation, health, things that help with those things. And there is need for action and commitment. As I said, we need more knowledge. So within healthcare and social services, implementation of welfare technology requires action and commitment across professional, organizational, sectoral and cultural boundaries so that we actually learn how to use the technologies and implement them in real working life, in real situations. Uh, the goals for this project well, to steer teachers towards methods of new teachership, the teaching methods I mentioned before, increase the knowledge and skills to use welfare technology among healthcare students and workers, and students and workers in the technical field as well. Because if you have appliances, they need maintenance, they need installation, they have software and stuff, so we need different professionals to work with technologies, not only social and healthcare. And we want to cross borders between curricula. It's typical we work within our own bubble, but it's good to extend, to expand, to learn uh, from each other, to learn about and from each other. And also we wanted to strengthen the cooperation with working life, but in this case, as I mentioned, we really couldn't get there and work with the companies. For the participants, for students, we want them to get experience of working in a multi-professional team. And of course, it develops your language skills when you communicate in a foreign language for, an, for a certain period of time. You get cultural awareness, you can't avoid it coming to you foreign country, different traditions. It's just a learning process. And key competencies, you always want to enhance your key competencies, teamwork, communication, problem solving. We have been solving problems this week as well. Responsibility, roles, you have your own role in your own team. And new professional skills, just skills in your own field, and new friends. For teachers, also new thing for many of us to get experience of working in multi-sexual teaching team. As I said, we kind of tend to work in our own bubbles, so it's good to ex expand our scenarios. And different and new teaching method, oh, this word is so different, difficult, methods, problem and case-based learning, flipped learning, design-based learning and teaching, and team teaching. Uh, for the teachers, the key com competencies as well. And new skills, new friends. <coughs> so what happens during the... has happened and will happen and, and is happening at the moment. We have had one um, teacher training week orientation when we started the project in th 2019. And when we close the project, the teachers will get together and that will be in December this year. And what we are doing here in um, the Basque country this week, but what we have been doing, it was a learning, teaching and training activity, a workshop for both students and teachers. And we have had one of those in Finland, and we will have one of those in the Netherlands later this year. So it's cross-curricular workshops, social and healthcare, electromechanical and media fields. And we saw problems related to the cases, the certain cases, client cases. And at the same time, with the student workshop, we had the teacher workshop, they go parallel during the week. And our the themes are the before mentioned teaching methods. 
and we work in multicultural and multiprofessional teams, learning, as mentioned before, professional skills, strengthening key competencies. And the first learning, teaching and training workshop we managed to have just a few months back due to the COVID situation. We had a long wait before we could start with these activities. And we, our, our theme was meaningful living at home and the pedagogical methods were team and case-based learning. This week, the main topic for for welfare technology or from the welfare technology point of view is safety and independence at home and we have used flipped learning teaching method during the week or actually already before the week and in the Netherlands in September the theme is caring using technologies to take care of people care and design and service thinking is the tool for that. And the product is a handbook for teachers using our teaching welfare technology together. And I don't know if I can, I'll try and find it here. Let's see if I can. Just, no, sorry. No. Here. There you can see. So from in here you will see um, the material we have produced so far during our weeks. There's information about the different teaching methods. There are all the presentations the students have prepared, the teachers have prepared. And there will be evaluation of the weeks and of the project later so the reader can see how we succeeded and how, fee, how we feel, or what we feel is usual, useful and what we feel might be done differently in a similar project later. All right, my sources. So as you see, I have some quotes there. And I have a short video just to sum it all up. As soon as I can find it. I think it's this one. Oh, it's, it's at the end of them. No. my presentation.
So thank you very much, Anne. I think we all have, and people who are listening especially, have a more clear idea what team we is and how much we are learning with it. Okay, now we're going to change topics. And I would like to welcome now Gorka Gastelumendi, who works here at Technica in the Bioscience and Sustainability um, Department. Gorka is involved in Smart Green Building Project. And today he's here to explain projects related to silver economy. So welcome, Gorka, and the Thank floor you. is yours. Okay. Well, good morning. Welcome to Technica. Uh, thank you, Nara. Um, well, I'm going to explain now uh, the projects we are uh, developing, we have developed, and we are now developing too, related to the silver economy. Um, the project that is directly uh, re uh, related to the silver economy is the Gunea Digital Home. But we, I think it's, it's better to understand if I show you where we started and where we are going to. So uh, the first project uh, when we started uh, taking into account the silver economy and the special needs is Tiny House. This, uh, this project was uh, it started, well, it started four years ago and uh, there were uh, nearly nine centers of vocational educational training schools participating. Uh, they were for different professional families, such as construction, energy, carpentry, electricity and electronics, social and cultural services. They are, some of them, we can think that they are a bit disconnected between them, but we saw that with a cooperation of different professional families, we can, we can expose each one, we can expose our knowledge and at the same time, we can receive the knowledge of the other families. So I'll show you this project, this is a small project that was designed by the teachers of these schools. And after the design process, the building was built by the students of these schools. So I'll show you the video so you can give a general idea of the tiny house. <laughs> The tiny house project involves the design and construction of a passive wooden microhouse, which is movable, accessible, smart, and energy efficient. One of the biggest problems in the future will be housing. With built up areas becoming ever denser, we need new sustainable housing projects, which rely less on large spaces. The tiny house project is geared towards research applied to professional training for new trends in buildings of the future under the Passive House Standard, which adheres to the European Directive on nearly zero energy buildings. Nine professional training centres working in building cycles, wood and furniture, energy and water, electronics and socio-cultural and community services have been involved through the Smart Green Buildings platform. As part of a collaborative working group, the centres each take charge of the different areas involved in the building process to create a unique prototype which enables the students to acquire knowledge and put new ideas into practice. Various professional families and professional training centres in the Basque country have been involved over the last two years in devising new building methods to improve the quality of life in our cities. The project has used sustainable materials, particularly wood owing to its benefits for construction and well-being, given it enables total thermal insulation to create comfortable spaces in which the temperature is self-regulated. Natural underfloor and wall insulation has been installed and energy losses have been reduced using layers and membranes which improve air tightness. Water, of course, plays an important role. Motorhome designs have been combined with standard installations to create a house with greater autonomy and which uses less energy. 
The project has been designed around the use of renewable energy technologies, such as solar panels and heat recovery units, which make greater use of the heat generated. The house is adapted and designed with dependent persons in mind and incorporates solutions to increase their independence and improve their comfort. Wireless automation and voice interaction with the space enable automatic control of the energy, security and communication systems. The result is a tiny house which showcases the value of teamwork and promotes respect for the environment, all of which is encompassed by the new training programmes of the 21st century. Okay. As you have seen, in this building was built on a trail, so um, the process of the building was um, going among the different schools. Uh, so it was, uh, it was, it got, it had been very grateful. So, uh, as you have seen, this one is, is, is more focused to the efficient building, but we started with, with some concepts of um, taking care and, and, and it, that was the time when we thought, what's the next step? And it's this project that is uh, more focused to the um, silver economy. It's called GUNEAC Digital Home Project. It was subsidized by Adinberry. It's an organization of Kipuzkoa. And what, uh, what uh, did, uh, do, did we do here? Well, um, mainly it's a technological and social watch study. What, what we do here is to analyze the needs of elderly people. We saw to, uh, what the, what's the situation of the digital, digital home technologies, but focused to improve the quality of life of the elderly people. Because it's technology for technology, we, we know that there is much technology, but we want to improve uh, the one who, who, is, who allows to improve the quality of people, the quality of life, and to have autonomous life, full life, and so on. So the first part of the document uh, is about the socio-demographic data. And we saw that our population in our country is getting older. I imagine your countries is happening more or less the same. Uh, in 10 years, it is estimated that 50% of the population will be over 55 years old. And our uh, life expectancy is increasing. So the dependency is increasing. If, if it's overaging, it's increasing much more. So we see that um, it's, uh, it's very important to take care of them. Uh, we see too that uh, the family patterns are changing. Some years ago, uh, it was more usual, at least here, that one of the parents, usually the mothers, they were, uh, no, maybe they were not working, they were taking of the elderly people, the grandparents, but nowadays, all of us wants to, want to work. So uh, the demand social services are increasing too. For the one, on the other hand, uh, the population pyramid, it's an example of Gipuzkoa. Well, we'll call it pyramid, but it seems more a tree or even a mushroom. We saw that the, most, uh, the range that most people live, it's over 35 to 65, more or less. And you can imagine in a few years what's going to happen. So we... We saw that elderly people, we are, we are, there are much more, even uh, year by year, and the activities of daily life. Uh, disability, the disabilities increase uh, if we are older too. So it's, uh, we thought that that was important too. And conceptual framework, it's another part we have uh, analyzed there. And according to the human scale development theory, we, we took that one like an example. I, we thought it was interesting. We saw that it divided uh, four, uh, four general points. Needs, satisfactors, quality of life, and life. The needs are the minimal essential requirements to live. The satisfactor will be the different strategies to satisfy uh, those needs. The quality of life, as a level of satisfaction for human needs, and the life as the process, as the entire process of our life. So um, we we choose the needs, dividing in two ones. Um, 
The former were the existential one, like be, have, do, and stay, and the latter, the axiological ones. They are the ones who give, give us like more, uh, a way to explain it could be, uh, more quality of life. So uh, with uh, two types of lines, we did a matrix. Uh, we, we, we constructed a 36 niche group. We have, are, you can see here the example. So uh, depending on the line, if there are different, different ones. So, for example, subsistence and half, it could be food, housing, work, and if we take subsistence and do, well, we can, as an example, eat, dress, rest. Well, there are, as you can see, there are, there are so much here. I'm, going, I'm not going to explain all the time because not, we don't have any, uh, enough time. So after that, we try to, to explain in this document the axiological needs to in each one. Try, we try to explain them. We give them different examples, but it's, um, a bit longer to, to explain now. We, as you can see, there are different examples. And after that, what did we see too? And it's just a reflection in this point. Uh, the concept of poverty. And usually when, when we think about a poor person, we, th we are thinking about money. But we see that these concepts of astrological needs, they are more, very important too because the, uh, showing this, uh, this picture, we saw the person on the right, on the right hand, well, he has, uh, he has many food, much food, drinks, a smartphone, but he's alone. The other one, well, it seems that he has not money, but well, at least he's, he's with a dog. Well, and we saw that the poverty of this, and uh, we know that money is important too, to live, to, but, but different concepts like subsistence, affections, and so on, they must be taken into account too. Just a reflection point. And digital home. We started thinking about, uh, is it digital home, is it necessary? And uh, can it give us, uh, well, something that we don't have? Because the home, uh, we saw that uh, elderly people, uh, they decide to live. They don't want to go uh, to a nursing home. They want to maintain their belonging concept because they live in, a, in their home all the year and they want to continue with that. Uh, they, we saw that and the, the, sorry, the, the house, the home, uh, it, it must be adaptable to the changing needs. We are getting older and we, we must to adapt to these needs too. And it must be easy, affordable, sustainable, because if it's, if it's too expensive, it doesn't, it doesn't need. So digital home, and uh, what's the digital home? Uh, we saw digital home at the one who uses integrated technological equipment and systems. And, and it offers these equipment, it offers, it makes easy the management of a maintenance of different devices, it increases the safety, it improves telecommunication, we can save money too because of the different uh, devices, and it's another way to offer, of it enter, entertainment, leisure, relationships. Well, and we saw it that there are different possibilities with a digital home. So, um, more it's an extent that how it, uh, how it works. Uh, for the one hand, in the in one house, we have a indoor electrical installation. It's necessary in our houses because all the devices work with electricity. And on the other hand, we have the telephone network, television network, information te technology network, but they are not in an usual home, they are not connected. So with a home automation control network and a residential gateway, and what we do is connect them. So we can manage different devices with a smartphone, voice control, and computer, tablet, it's, there are different ways. And this, this installation, there are different ways. We have four different words, forms, sorry. A star, bus, electrical network, and mesh. The star, and to have a general idea, is the one who has a main device and all the uh, controllers, devices, all are control, are connected in this device. The problem, if, it, if 
this device doesn't work, the system falls. So, well, it's, it's not a very expensive one, but it has this handicap. So there is another one, it's more complex, that it's the home automation bus. It's a right uh, connection, but it's not, uh, it's not with a main device. All the devices are connected. If, in the, if one doesn't work, it doesn't matter. We have the other ones. This is more complex, more expensive too. Another one, that is uh, it's not used here. Um, maybe some years ago there was more usual, but it's not, and it's quite unusual now. Uh, we don't have any other installation. We have only the electrical installation, but it's not very used system because nowadays we see that the stability decreases. It's not as stab stable like the other ones. It's cheaper, but it's not stable. And the last one is the, well, the most known one, the wireless system. Uh, it's quite economic because we don't, we don't need in the house, we don't need just the, the main entrance of the internet system and with a Wi-Fi system, well, the, the other devices are connected there. Uh, the Wi-Fi one is uh, the most famous one, but there are other ones like Z-Away, Zigbee, uh, Bluetooth low energy and thread, but well, each one has different characteristics, some advantages, some disadvantages, but well, the most famous one we have uh, to have a general idea is the Wi-Fi one. So after this analyze, what do we do? Uh, we did a table with different solutions for the digital home. We analyzed uh, uh, over 240 uh, elements, so we we analyzed and we, we, we wanted to score them. So what we do, uh, we, we took this case, affordable, integrable, easy to install and usability, and depending on different ranges, what we did is, each element has, in this case, we, they has one to four stars. You have uh, here, and as an example, well, these devices, these 240 devices, they were divided in the, that axiological needs I have explained before and we, we organize them and we, in one, in each element, we have a short explanation, a couple of sentences to have a general idea and we score them in these four keys. Well, I think they could be, <coughs> they could be quite useful because, well, and there are some of them, they are well, basic ones, but the other ones, there are some of them that maybe we, we don't know them. And at the final of the document, well, we, what we did, now we have this information, and uh, we did some encounters, some round tables with different teachers, uh, different professional families, like social and cultural community services, and electricity and electronics. They are not, they are, uh, they are not so near each other, but we saw that uh, uh, with this round table, they were uh, quite grateful, and we concluded uh, some points we saw because each one has uh, more knowledge about some items and the other one in, in other ones. So what we do is uh, the elderly people, protagonist of his life. Of course, we, I think we, all, we always, all of them, all of us understand it. They have a specific needs for their activities, more dependency, benefits of digital home. We see that there are some benefits because uh, it could be useful and it could uh, help them. But this technology can't, can't replace human presence. The human presence is obligatory. It's, it's, it's very important for us. And the characteristics of the digital home, uh, universal design, functional, easy to use, easy to learn, because they, some of them can not have some difficulties to, uh, to learn it, affordable cost for all of them, scalable and integrable. And, about needs, we saw that it could be interesting to have role-specific training needs for elderly people, caregiver, medical care, and it could be interesting to, to maybe to, uh, to make like a mixture of different profiles, uh, different professional profiles that combine technology and care, because uh, it's, uh, they are far, but uh, it's important. we see that it's important to combine them. That's more or less the the, the project which, uh, which is focused specifically in, in silver economy. 
But I'm now, in a few words, I, I'm going to explain another project that after this one, what we see that, well, it's true, the, the population is getting older, but we see that uh, the special needs, uh, there are moreover. There is not the, only for them. We have blind people, deaf, deaf, a person with wheelchairs, and so on. So we see that uh, we can study what technology is uh, available for them too. So what are, are we going to do? Because we are just doing it. We started with this project uh, last year, but now we are constructing. And what are constructing? We are, uh, we are building one bedroom home. It's just here at the end of this corridor. If it were finished, we could visit it, but it's not possible. And, and it's especially it's an accessible home for a wheelchair user, but it has a home automation. We introduced here uh, the more complex one of this technology I explained before, the KNX technology, and we have a console, the lighting, electric power, sound, blind, plugs, and so on. So um, with a smartphone, voice control, computers, and we'll start and we'll try to connect with more devices too. Apart from that, we want to introduce a robot which an assistive robot that can help us too, to have the control of the building, and virtual reality and augmented reality glasses. They have well, different usabilities. The first one maybe is focused more for sport, uh, virtual travels, and the second one can help us to control the, just the house. As it's not finished, I'll show you uh, some photographs or some plans to, to have an idea. It's a previous classroom, just, just after the final of the corridor, with an, a simple housing program with an entrance, a kitchen, a dining room. At the end, there is a bedroom and a, and a bathroom too. And we have virtual terrace. It's, in, it's an indoor terrace, but maybe it's for the future it can be useful to have a well, to have an experiment, so it's just uh, distinguishing the color of the floor. So uh, all, the, all the work is done with false sailing, technical floor and technical partition, so this electrical and home automation and installation can be introduced there, and if in the future, if you see that it's interesting to introduce more, well, it could be quite easy. With a distribution, I have uh, adapted to a wheelchair regulation with a sensory fall floor for detection, fall detections too, <coughs> and the installation of domotics. Well, I'm not going to explain them because it's too complex, but it's, uh, as you can see, it's quite complex, but we'll, we want to control all the devices that are introduced just now and in the future, we'll try to do them to, with the new ones. And some photographs to have an idea. That's the the classroom, uh, we are just making the partitions and some, some conducts are installed too. And how to work? Well, for the one hand, we'll try uh, technique and bed collaborators working. Uh, we'll be there with an open vision and considering different needs. And the other hand, we'll, we would like the participation of different institutions and organizations because they have previous knowledge, they want, they know much about these items and they have more contacts uh, uh, with different companies and they can help us too. And we don't, we want it like, to use like a laboratory, like a living lab and to try current products and develop new ones too. And that's more or less the project. Uh, thank you for listening to me. And I would like to finish uh, well, I have, as I have said before, technology, we have much technology, but I will show you a short video on how humanized technology can be used in another way to understand. Thank you. You teach us that technology can improve people's lives, help them in their day to day improved applications that foster their independence.
teach us that technology unites us and brings us closer to the people we love. Let's learn how to design devices that can help take care of others with applications that help improve our health, offering us a more hopeful future. We have learned that technology is useful on many fronts, including bringing us closer to those who are no longer among us. Sometimes, what a person needs is not a brilliant mind that talks, but a heart that listens. Thank you. So thank you very much, Gorka, for this interesting and inspiring presentation. I think it was very interesting to see about the tiny house, which is a success story, and it reflects the cooperation of Basque vet schools. It was really interesting to see that reflection on the needs and to see how welfare technology can help meet those needs. And the last project you are involved in, which is the Smart Adapted Housing. Thank you for highlighting how important the combination of technology and care is. For focusing on humanized technology, we see that there is much done in this field and there is much to be done. Okay, and now we change the topic of the presentation. We're going to welcome now our teachers. Yeah? They are going to talk us about different methodological approaches. First, we'll have a short introduction from Nina Escola Salin and Hane Maki Hakola from uh, TAMC, which is the Tampere University of Applied Sciences. Yeah? and they belong to the Department of Vocation Teacher Education. They will give us a short introduction, and then we, after this, we will have three short presentations focused on these methodological approaches we have listened about. First, we will have Jolanda Van Til from Deltion College, and she will talk about dialogical guiding as a teamwork, and she will focus on teachers' roles. After Yolanda, we will have Inga Pontio from Tredu, Tampere, and she will talk us about flipped learning. And finally, we will have Patrick Pickhelder, I think, who will, from Deltion College also, who will talk about case-based learning. So, welcome, Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, I would like to introduce our teachers' teams and uh, I the They can show the program. Okay. 
<laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll just explain. Okay, so like Anne told uh, la last time in, in Tampere, the, um, the teacher's point of view was, was team teaching and case-based learning. Now, and now we continue, continued with those teams, but we added the flipped learning to the process. And while the students has been, has been working with their cases, the teachers has been working together with the uh, teaching methodologies. And please, welcome, Yolanda will start, and then Inga will join, and Patrick will be the third team. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nina. <coughs> no, I don't. <laughs> So, good morning, everybody. My name is Yolanda van Til from the Deltion Collegia. I'm an expert teacher, and I'm also a project leader of the theme Health and Technology. And we find at the Deltion Collegia, it's a very important issue to work on. And uh, this week, we are all learning new things. So, we have to work with Sway for the first time. So, it was uh, fun learning new things. And I'm going to tell you something about teachers' roles and teamwork. And why this question, why we paid so much attention to this subject this week. It was in Finland and we are with a group of uh, 16, no, 12 teachers. Um, and the role of the teachers is to guide the students in their process of working on the cases. And as a teacher, we find it very difficult how can we guide the students in the right way? And how can we divide the roles? And what can we do to get uh, our knowledge to bring in the project in a good way? So we were wondering after the week in Finland, how can we do that this week in Basque Country? And we said, well, we are going to try to divide roles in the teachers' groups who, the, who guide the students' groups. And probably it makes it more clear what the role of the teacher is and how we can be of worth for the students in their process. So that's a bit of history why we think it was important for us in this project to work on team teaching that we can divide the roles for the teachers. And then we say we have few four roles we tried this week. And first of all, it was the role of team leader. You see at the picture, the team leader is the one in front of it. And the team leader will lead the group and the students through the process. And what we say, the team leader is the one in the team that has to be in control. He has to know the schedule, the timing, what are we going to do. He has to be in control of the process. Are the teachers doing their work? Are the students doing their work? But they are also observing the process. Is everything going well? And the team leaders also must realize good preconditions that everybody can do his work. That everybody has a good computer, can work on the internet, understand how Sway works. So that was the role of team leader. And we also say we have some very clever people in our team, the welfare experts, the persons thinks they know everything about welfare technology. And they say they, those were the people, they must be in control, responsible of the content where the students are going to work on. Um, and those teachers, the welfare experts, it has their task to ask questions to the students instead of giving information. And this one was so difficult because I was one of the welfare experts 
and it's so easy to say, well, I can give you all the solution you want for the case, but that's not my task. I have to ask the students, did you visit that website? Have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? I think students weren't always happy when I was asking all those questions, but it makes that they are going to investigate themselves what are the good solutions. So we are trying as experts to find new ways of sharing our information. And sometimes it, we will manage in a good way, and sometimes probably not. Another role was the role of the student's shepherd, of the student's guidance, and you see a shepherd on the screen. And uh, what was the task of the student's shepherd, student's guidance, sorry. <laughs> They are responsible also about the process of the students. How are the students working together? Because the students have a role in their team too. Is everybody doing their things? Are there questions? The student guidance role also detects the needs of the students. And it's very important that they always ask open questions and be very curious if everything is all right with the students. And the last role we had was one of the presentation coordinator. And that was the person who was uh, responsible for creating good presentations like this way and also have a look at the student's presentation. Uh, listening and writing down while we are talking about the presentation. And in our group we were wondering, is this role really ne necessary if we have our next LTT week in Zwolle do we need this role? Is it important? So that's one we have to think of between the period till Zwolle. And then teamwork, tips to make it work. As a team, you have to make appointments about how to work together. It seems so easy. And more and more, I realize as a teacher that we want our students to work in projects, that they want to work together. And we are talking about that, but when we look at ourselves, when we are working in a team, how do we do it? And the tips we gave to students, do we well, use those tips for ourselves? So we say when you work in teams, you really have to make appointments about how to work together. And it's also needed to clarify the rules. In our group, we saw that the role of welfare expert, a very fanatic welfare expert, uh, and the role of student guidance, that's, that was not good for the students, because then we both go to the students, how are you doing, do you this, do you this? So that was too much. So I learned that as a welfare expert, I had to wait to the student guidance said to me, well, I think they need a bit more expert now, so go. So it was nice finding out how the roles were and what you expect from each other. And this was also interesting. You can feel powered by your role because maybe it is not in your nature to be the project leader. But if you have that role and you were forced to manage that role, you can learn how, to I how it is to be a team leader and you can learn few new things and will be more certain about your role to do it another time. And we said working in a team teaching is a process. It needs a lot of time. But we think team teaching must be fun. Because sometimes when there are struggles, when you are looking for the borders between the roles, it might be nice to make a joke of it and laugh about it and learn how you can manage, so it doesn't mean that it, me that it has to be negative, but keep it in a positive way, because life is always learning. Thank you. So we can see techniques is so difficult. Okay. 
you can hear me. Hello for everyone. My name is Inga Pöntjö and I'm coming from Tampere, Finland. And I'm working there as a teacher in social and healthcare field. And I'm teaching nowadays uh, uh, welfare technology. And I'm working many different developing projects concerning welfare technology. We have been here very interesting week in this week and we have worked very hard, I think. And for, uh, I'm going to tell something about flip learning. We have worked uh, in international teaching groups and here come some thoughts. If I can use this. So we have thinking what the flip learning is and is there some benefits and or it could be some risks. We have thought, thought about that and in the end of the, my presentation there are some tips for the teachers. So flip learning, it's a pedagogical approach. Uh, students become familiar with teaching materials in advance and continue to study in the classroom. Uh, the material could be an article, video, some exercise, or something else concerning, concerning the next lesson's content, or the whole course, of course. And then the actual content teaching, when the students come back to school, can be used to deepen or discussing things which makes learning more efficient. We have used uh, uh, SWOT analyze to think about strengths and opportunities, and here comes some words about that. Strength and opportunities. These are good, this is benefits. It gives students the opportunity to work individually and learn at different rhythms. So they can study, for example, in evenings time, uh, after their hobbies, or in the bus, or train, uh, or, or so on. And lessons are very well struck. Uh, there, there is a time for communication in the, when the students come back to school, the teacher, student, and maybe student, student in the little groups as well. Students and teachers' digital skills improve. If you send them to students, the, for example, a link to some article, or maybe they have to so, uh, see a video, so they have to find it, how it goes. And teachers' work becomes more sustainable and creative. You can use, if you're a teacher, you can use the same, same uh, material, pre-material, many times. But there could be some weaknesses and threats. Sometimes it happens so that teachers fall back in lecturing. Maybe they forget in the classroom that um, uh, not to continue discussing about the pre-material or, or, or deepen it. So just start lecturing. Poor task planning from the teacher. Uh, we all teachers know we have so much little time to prepare. So it could be so that I just I just thinking I, I send the link to video and that's all. Uh, maybe they are using non-updated material, all the same, many years, same pre-material. Difficulties in involving students in the group. Uh, because if they are working independent, individually at home, so it's it's hard to uh, involve the students in the group when they're back in school, for example. And there are always differences in the student levels. And tips for using: find your own way, do it what you are easy to, to easy to use. Prepare the students, give good instructions, because they are always so that the students don't know, I, di I didn't know what to do. Be selective on the videos and material you use. There is a lot of information in the internet. 
collaborate with colleagues in different roles, as we have done this week. Reflect and adjust. Thank you. Do I this need now? You hear me? Yes. Thank you, Nina. Welcome. My name is uh, Patrick Pekelder, and for the last five minutes, I'm going to tell you something about taste based learning. Uh, the letters CBL I will use. Let's have a look. In our team, uh, we talked and learned uh, a lot about uh, case-based learning. And I will tell you the most important aspects of case-based learning now. So, you uh, see here the strengths and opportunities of case-based learning. For the first, uh, the the collection to real life is motivating. That means when you have a case, it's real uh, for a person that will motivate and stimulate the students in a good way. So that's the most important thing. Um, the next point, learning to combine different subjects and skills, uh, that means that they are learning to combine knowledge, uh, for example, health and technology, but um, also uh, to combine uh, the digital skills. And for the third point, the method encourages to creative things. That means they, the students can more thinking out of the box. That's a very important too. And the fourth point, you see uh, one case can create new cases. Uh, that means that there is a possibility to expand situations and uh, to get more challenging situations for students. That's very important. The fifth point, uh, learning situations uh, for the teachers too. Um, yeah, it is not predictable what kind of solutions students came with. So uh, if there is a new uh, situation, that will be learning for the teacher too. And the last, when working in groups, it's a social uh, process. That means, for example, uh, the students have discussions with each other in the group, and they can play uh, each uh, another role. For example, um, they can be the leader, uh, and the other write down uh, the, the solutions of the case. That's very good. But there are also weaknesses and threats. The first, poor pre-material preparation. Students uh, could have be uh, not prepared properly, that is possible. Um, but the, the second point, not enough time. It costs a lot of time to make a good uh, case with all aspects in it, all different aspects in it. The third point is equal participation and um, you have to be aware that not every student can be involved. The other point is students lack of knowledge and skills. It's also uh, very important eh, to solve the case. So if there are not enough uh, knowledge and skills then that will be a problem. Immaturity of the students, that means the, the students don't take responsibility for the work, for the task. That can be true. Case limits the learning process. That means, for example, that it, it is no guarantee that the whole topic is covered. And last but not least, the evaluation. Uh, probably the, the evaluation costs a lot of time. That are the weaknesses and threats. But the most important thing is that case-based learning 
is a way of thinking for students out of the box thinking and motivates them a lot for to be uh, looking at this solutions for the problem. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, all of you, for these interesting presentations. And you have seen that team working is about cooperation, collaboration, and coordination. And I want to use Yolanda's words that this teaching and learning process can be fun. It is a process. And Patrick's words also that all of us have to think out of the box. So we are going to finish this part. We are going to have a, a break. We see each other here at half past 11, isn't it? So that you can have a coffee, we can have a coffee, and we will be here with our most important protagonists, students. We are going to listen to how they worked and how they solved their cases. Thank you very much. See you in 20 minutes.
hello again. Yeah, now, as I told you before, it's our students' turn. Yeah, as Anne told you before, they have been working in cross-curricular international teams, which is quite a challenge. She told you that we have students from different specialities, and you will see to what they have done during this week, sharing all their knowledge. So first, we are going to have the yellow team with us. Their case is Amalia's case. And we will welcome Mikkel, Caroline, Alina and Julia. After the yellow team, we have the green team. And their case is Lupe. And we have Olivia, Sofia, June and Joran. And last but not least, the blue team. Yeah? Their case was Ana Maria's. And we have Mikkel, Miren, Thomas, and Anette. So, I want to welcome the yellow team. First, uh, we want to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Carlijn and I'm studying social work. Hello, my name is Alina. I'm from uh, Delgen College at Zwolle and I'm studying software developing. Uh, my name is Mikkel and I am studying uh, social worker. My name is Julia. I'm from Finland and I'll become electrician. Um, first, who is Amalia? <laughs> Amalia is 82 years old. She lives alone in urban area in apartment. Uh, Amalia's husband died a year ago and she has six children. She has diagnosis for hypercholesteremia mild arterial, generalized arthrosis, repeated urinary infections, and frequent colds. She also has osteomuscular problems with mineral trauma to her left hip, elbow, and right knee. He has needed relative rest at home and anti-inflammatory analgesics for a period of six to 10 days. She is afraid to go outside and shower because she has fallen a couple times. She also has difficulties in doing household chores like cleaning and ironing. Um, Amalia is very caring for her family and she is very independent person so she do not want to ask help very often. Um, our first solution for the difficulties in doing household chores is um, her family helping she for with cleaning and groceries and since her children are visiting her every day they can help it very easily. The second uh, problem of uh, Amalia is fear of falling. So for this uh, problem, we have few solutions. In this video, I will show you the first solution is the hip airbag or like um, normal airbag. So you can see the video. Each and every year, more than 5 million older people are treated in emergency departments after fall injuries. One out of five falls causes a serious injury such as broken bones or a head injury. Future Age is a personal airbag based on DAR technology that protects against this risk. 
Thanks to its intelligent algorithm, Future Age is able to detect the fall and in a few milliseconds inflates the airbag. This system of integrated airbags is designed to protect the most in danger areas of the body, such as hips and head of femur, back and spinal cord, shoulders, cervical and head. An automatic emergency call is generated to one or more people right after the fall. The person is located with a GPS and can communicate in the phone call and explain what is happening. Yes, because Amalia has uh, already fallen a few times earlier and she had already broken her bones, so it might help her to um, go outside alone and not with her children. So. She also afraid to go to the bathroom alone, so maybe it's possible to um, have like an empty slip uh, mat for a bathroom, so she uh, she won't fall. Also, also it's um, necessary to have like bathroom handles, so she can hold herself and not sleep uh, every time. So. Um, musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal problems and some traumas. Um, uh, we think that the worker is a good solution for this problem. Uh, the worker will provide security for Amelia um, it prevents falls by being a stable foothold that she can constantly hold on to. It makes it easier to walk around the house and on the street, which will encourage uh, Amelia to walk more often. Um, the other solution uh, for this is a tablet. Amelia um, is afraid of going to the doctor. So the tablet uh, can be a very good option that allows us to make calls with, her, with the doctor and with her children. Uh, Amelia has to take medicine every day, so uh, this machine will rem remember the medicine that they have to take each day. Um, she also has problems with her personal uh, hygiene, so first we thought about the chair in her bathroom. Um, she only uh, goes to the bathroom where her children are home, and um, because she's afraid to fall, so we thought maybe when she has a chair in her shower, um, she can sit down and shower herself better and um, do it by herself because she wants to do uh, the most on her own. And um, her children uh, are, fishing, uh, are visiting her every day um, and only showers then, but not uh, every day. So we want to um, discuss with her children that she can go like every day or like uh, on Monday and Wednesday. Um, so her children can help and there don't need be um, a nurse or anything to come to her home. Um, in case of an emergency, um, she failed a couple times, so we thought it's necessary that there, um, she can um, uh, put an alarm button on her neck. Um, so when something goes wrong or she failed or um, anything, she always can push the button. Um, and um, then her children or a nurse, like in the district, uh, can have a sign and um, can go to her and help her. Um, and also a smart door handle um, that's easier so everyone can keep, come in. Um, so when she puts the button, uh, the, button um, the people know the code so everyone can come in um, and it's also easier for herself. First we thought about um, uh, a key 
uh, box, uh, but we think this is easier. Like everyone has the code, so everyone can come in. Um, and she can use it by herself, but there's also a key. So if she don't uh, want to use uh, the code by herself, she can use the key. Um, I think we're missing a part, like your part, right? Oh, no, okay. Um, uh, that was our presentation. So, thank you very much. Green team, please. Okay, hi. So we're Team Green, and this is how are we? Mm, yeah. So my name is Sophia. I'm uh, 24 years old. I'm studying to be in a practical nurse, and I'm from Finland. My name is Olivia, and I'm 19 years old, and I'll become an electrician, and I'm from Finland. My name is Yune, I'm 16 years old, I study social care and I'm from Sarout. I'm uh, Johan, I'm 18 years old, uh, I study software development in uh, the Netherlands on Deltion College. So our case was Loop and uh, she's uh, 80 five years old, she lives alone, and that's why she feels lonely sometimes. Uh, she has a daughter of five, uh, daughter and five siblings, and she also has a dog that she loves so much. She has Alzheimer, and that brings different problems in her life. And um, a few years ago, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, because of that, it's hard to feed, and wash, and dress her herself, and she also forgets to keep the house clean and to take her medications. She often burns her food because she forgets she had it on. She does not remember where she keeps things and forgets the forgets her keys in the front door of the house. Uh, she also has sunset syndrome, so it's difficult for her to see at dusk. <laughs> because of the Alzheimer loop has gold swings, has mood swings and she's irritable and angry, but sometimes there's good days too. She feels lonely because all her friends are dead. Loop has three brothers and two sisters who used to visit her four or five times in a week and she also has a daughter who visit her two times in a week. Now they don't see each other that often because of COVID. She also has a dog, but the dog is five years old and it helps her to go out sometimes. Participation. Um, Loop doesn't have any friends, but she likes to go out with her family and going on a walk with her dog she, when she is not tired. She also likes to read and listening to music. Her passion was roller skating, but she can't do it anymore because over the years she has gotten less flexible. She does not work, but does has responsibilities, for example, to cook her food or take her medication, walk the dog and feed the dog. She has a dog, so she goes out every day. She likes to go to the park and it's a very important place to her because it reminds her of her childhood. Her daughter and siblings are only people she sees, so unfortunately she doesn't see them that often any anymore because of COVID.
she is not part of any community and she doesn't have any religion. She would like to start a new hobby so she can meet new people. Okay, now we're going to talk about the, the solutions we have. Okay, we have uh, thought of a couple solutions. We uh, look at uh, every aspect that uh, she has with uh, all the diseases she has or the loneliness. So um, we looked at um, uh, like uh, she can more connect with people. So we for that have a tablet for video calls. Um, we try to not make it as uh, difficult of a, a tablet device to use because she has Alzheimer's. It's very difficult to learn. So that's why um, we used uh, uh, the Google ecosystem and uh, then she can just use her voice to call her friends or she can also uh, use it as a tablet. Um, we have uh, for the cooking, we have a heat sensor because she sometimes forgets she has uh, food on. So um, then the food will burn. Uh, the heat sensor will also uh, turn off the electricity automatically when it uh, gets too hot. Um, for cooking, to help with loneliness, uh, uh, we, uh, you can also set up Zoom meetings so you, she can uh, cook with uh, other elderly people and uh, then they can connect with uh, each other and make new friends. Um, we have for the medication, we have uh, a medication dispenser. It's, uh, it uh, goes off when she needs to take her uh, medication. You can also set, uh, set up reminders on uh, the Google. Uh, I am now going to show you uh, the pictures. We also have uh, for the showering, we have an uh, easy seat, so uh, she, uh, she won't fall, so she can take a seat. Okay, that's this. <laughs> okay, um, so we use this, it's a big tablet, it also has a camera, you can uh, see it, so she can call with her friends and uh, also with the caretakers, that's very important, so you can the caretakers don't have to come every time to her house, so she can communicate with them. Okay, uh, this is the stove card. Uh, you, have, uh, you also have an app for it, but uh, you uh, don't need to use it. You can um, set up alerts for uh, the caretaker and the client, and um, when the stove gets too hot, they both get an alert, and uh, the caretaker then will know and they can communicate uh, with the client also through the Google. This is the, this is the medicine dispenser. It uh, shows at what time she needs to take it. It has a screen so she can see the scheme when she needs to take it so she can constantly be reminded of when she needs to take her pills. It's very important. Uh, she also has uh, difficulties with uh, sunset syndrome, but uh, Olivia will explain uh, a little bit further about that. Mm. Alzheimer patient is uh, difficult to separate day and night, and that's why she needs automatic lights that turn on and off by themselves led strip on the roof so when she need to go to the bathroom at the night she just follow the light and in her in her home should be sufficient lighting because because it's difficult to her to see at dusk um we have also set up some uh cameras it's a uh, very easy uh, for uh, the caretakers to take a look. Um, we also have a fall detection. Um, we also fall detection, so the caretaker will get an alert uh, when she uh, falls down. <coughs> so they can uh, double check on the cameras because uh, sometimes uh, the fall detector can uh, give a false alert. So um, uh, it's very nice because uh, uh, 
I think y you can communicate uh, also with each other. So she won't feel it lonely anymore. <laughs> and uh, this was our, uh, our project. Thank you very much, Yune, Olivia, Sofia, and Joran. And now it's the turn for the blue team, who are going to talk us about Ana Maria's case. Ready? Hello, everyone. Uh, we have the case of Ana Maria. Uh, so yeah, this is our presentation. Um, who are we? I am Thomas, I'm from uh, Deltium College uh, in Zwolle, the Netherlands. I'm Mikkel, I'm from Eibar and I'm a student of Automotive on Mecca on Ergoibar. Hello, uh, I'm Miriam, I'm 18 and I'm from Eibar and I'm studying soci social care. Hi, I'm Anette, I'm from Finland and I'm studying to be a practical nurse. To start, we present you Anna Maria. She is a 80 year old woman. She lives alone on a old house with old furniture. Um, she has a son uh, who lives uh, in a nervous town. She just likes to, to read, watch TV, playing cards and chatting with uh, her friends. And uh, she was a cheerful woman, but now she, she is depressed because uh, she, can, she can't do the things she used to do. What is macular degeneration? A uncommon eye disorder among people over 50 years it's caused blue red or reduced uh, the central vision and over time your vision may worsen and affect your ability to do and see things. And Ana Maria has a diabetes a of type 1. A the type 1 of diabetes is a serious condition um, where your blood glucose, uh, the level is uh, too high because your body can make hormone called insulin. And we will, we all need insulin to live because it does an essential job and it allows the glucose in our blood to enter our cell and fuel our bodies. So here's the problems. So Anna Maria has diabetes 1. She has macular degeneration in both eyes so she can't see close. She's depressed because she can't do things she likes. She also has problem with cooking because she confused some food with others and also confuse the projects that she cannot see. She has problem with cleaning, she can't read, watch TV, play cards, she cannot read, recognize faces or object up close. So here's the solution for diabetic one, insulin pump, a nurse and her son and friends can have app on their phone. Uh, the app call Freestyle Libre and there the nurse and the son can see the level of insulin. Uh, the nurse can change the pump once a week and the nurse gonna measure the level of sugar in the blood once a week also. She will be assistant with the food service when her friends and son are not able to assist with cooking. Uh, because in if you have diabetic one, the food is important because if you don't eat, the diabetic one go worse. Uh, because diabetic one often cause leg pains and muscle failure, she have to get a physiotherapist. The solutions for the macular degenerations are uh, 
for start uh, a small magnifier. It's like a, a glass that um, uh, makes bigger the a book or a tablet or to see better. Then uh, we choose to have a bigger a smart TV um, with a smart functions and because of the vision problem to watch the TV better. Um, we also thought about uh, get rid of some old furniture to make some uh, more room too hard to walk. Mm. We thought uh, to install Senior Tech is a intelligent flower plant for messaging mm, for <laughs> messaging the sun if she fell down or if she <laughs> to uh, the message the sun and the nurse if she fell down or if she got any problem then uh, she could use a worker uh, to walk better. And uh, she also have activity therapist uh, to cook and, and the stuff she liked uh, with the therapist. There we can see uh, Ana Maria's, um, to help Ana Maria new technologies. And, uh, for example, to play in cards, uh, we choose giant cards or iPad, uh, to cleaning robot vacuum cleaner with a mop, uh, to social connection, uh, we can use uh, video visit or FaceTime, to read, we can use to uh, Kindle, audiobooks or iPads, and a smart speaker with virtual assistant, uh, we choose Alexa or, or Siri. Now, uh, what's our, uh, her life with the solutions? Now, Anna Marie uh, will be more happier, safer, and live a healthier life. Uh, she doesn't feel lonely anymore because she can uh, do things uh, now better. She's not depressed. Uh, cooking is not a problem anymore. And she can walk fr uh, freely inside and outside her home. She also doesn't have to go to the doctor the or a therapist that often because you can uh, video call the, the doctor and the nurse. Now this was, <laughs> this was our presentation. Thank you and I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Mikkel, Miren, Thomas and Anette. So, um, thank you very much for being there. I hope you enjoyed this seminar as much as I did. I want to ask you for a big applause for our students who made it really good. I also I want to thank our partners from Deltion College, Tamk University of Applied Sciences, Tredu, of course, on behalf of Mecca Lambida Escola. Yeah. It was a pleasure to have you here this week. It's been really nice to host you here. And I think the VET system is really doing a good job in preparing our students for a more sustainable world. Yeah, they are our future. Yeah. And finally, to finish, I, want, I would like to see you all here in San Sebastian at the World Federation Con Colleges and Polytechnics Congress, which is going to be here in San Sebastian in June this year. So you'll be welcome. And thank you, everyone. Let's have the video of the Congress, please. Uh, 
The future will bring unknown challenges that will change the way we live and work. Technical vocational education and training can provide us with so much as it prepares our future professionals. We have to relearn the learning process. Innovation is the key. We have to adapt to digitalization, connectivity and smart systems, as well as values such as sustainability, social inclusion and solidarity. It is time to get to know each other, to share so that we can move forward, time to listen, to learn and to network. We have a great opportunity to know how excellence is achieved in the Basque Country, Europe and around the world. We can discover different ways of working together to achieve gender equality and human migration. When you come, you'll see that the Basque Country is a place of traditions and innovation. The opportunity to prepare ourselves for the future.